want to highlight four major areas of uncertainty about the future of the Internet whose resolution will shape the future of the Internet. The first area of critical uncertainty involves the kind of Internet we have from the standpoint of the Internet's architecture and from its adoption. The second involves what kind of information policies we have, that is, the kinds of rules we develop about information property, such as copyright, patents, and trademarks, and the marketplace norms that apply to property. The third involves the kind of policies and norms we develop about our online identities, specifically the policies and practices we construct about online privacy, anonymity, and surveillance. The fourth area of uncertainty is that we do not yet know the full impact of the Internet when it comes to economic, medical, social, and political outcomes. The social science community is just beginning to tackle uh, these issues in empirical terms, and the data are not yet in. In the times that we ask people, why don't you use the Internet or broadband, we find that two-thirds tell us that they don't want it, don't need it, or have become frustrated uh, with, the, uh, with the small amount of experience that they have with technology and, and the Internet. The question is whether the experience of the Internet through a device like this is as meaningful and brings as many benefits as on a lecture experience on a laptop or a desktop. A number of the builders of the Internet are trying to construct new architecture that is less vulnerable and more efficient as a way to facilitate communication and information flows. Those at the center of the start over Internet are, say they are trying to resolve four key problems with the current Internet. First, it's the security problem. No one expected that the level of malevolence online to be what it is when they were first constructing the protocols and the, and the hardware that, was, that became the Internet. Start over planners would love to build a new system that would do a better job of authenticating people and their computers in a way that would help them keep hazards like vi viruses at bay. No one foresaw the level of traffic the Internet would bear and there are all sorts of hassles in the way that data moves uh, around the Internet these days. So the start over group would like to build something allowing all pieces of the network to have the ability to detect and report to network administrators emerging problems such as technical breakdowns, traffic jams, or replicating worms. The mechanics of the Internet itself are a work in progress, and how they are resolved will have important consequences for the performance and utility of the Internet in the future. So that's uncertainty number one. I'll turn to uncertainty number two now. It involves policies and practices related to information itself. Who owns it, for how long, how much information and media can legitimately be remixed and shared, how much will people pay to access information and media that matters to them, how much personal information that is revealed online, advertently or inadvertently, should be cataloged and synthesized and then used for marketing purposes. People who are now growing up uh, digital, the Generation Y, as they move through their lives and, and take power of our institutions and take power o over the, for the protocols and, and mechanisms of the Internet, uh, they will bring with them the newer values and the different values that, about property, sharing, and paying for content that have defined their lives in a very different way from the experience of their parents and their grandparents. A premise of the Knight Commission and many of those who are advocates in this room is that you are somehow harmed in major ways when you don't have access, but no one has yet been able to quantify exactly what that means and what that deficit amounts to. Similarly, we have no data yet on improvements that occur in learning, especially in formal education outcomes when Internet use is encouraged in school-related work, nor do we know the impact on medical outcomes. Uh, that occur when people use the Internet to gather health information and share their stories about their own experience and diseases and treatments. Uh, finally, we don't know uh, about the possibility that inter use, Internet use produces new involvement with civic and political life by those who might be otherwise engaged. I would add another area of scarce data that doesn't entirely relate to the Internet but is central to the role that the Internet plays in people's lives. We don't yet have a deep understanding or a, a well-developed scholarship about the ways that information markets perform. There is enormous concern in the medical community, in newsrooms, among librarians, among scholars and social critics, that the Internet is enabling bad information and bad actors to influence others in bad ways. They are deeply anxious that people are self-diagnosing and self-medicating and hurting themselves uh, as a result. 
They fear that spin and disinformation are influencing the way that people vote. They fear that powerful profiling tools are being used to shape consumer tastes in subtle and sometimes sinister ways. They are dismayed that those full of hate and ill intentions have new ways to organize and new outlets for expressing themselves. What we don't know with any certainty is whether those concerns are outweighed by the benefits that are afforded by the internet. So we have our work cut out for us when it comes to shaping the internet of the future. One thing that I think is not arguable is that regardless of where that innovation may go, what that uncertainty may yield, is that we have to address trust and confidence in the medium, the security aspect. This will have implications for architecture, for authentication, for policy, certainly. Uh, but if the medium is, as I think we probably all believe, a great, the world's greatest medium for innovation and connectivity with other human beings, if it's going to be the, the greatest platform for innovation, it must be a platform for participation. So more people feel trust and confidence they connect yields more innovation. So it seems uh, unavoidable to me that we address that in many ways as, uh, as Lee suggested. One of the other features uh, that is, um, I think, fundamentally uh, essential uh, and lies behind much of what Lee just presented to us um, the reason that these things are conundrums, these uh, security, authentication, privacy, um, identification, and so forth issues, is that the Internet is a, a, a voluntarily interconnected set of networks. There is no central controlling authority. There is no body, uh, no government, that can decree uh, what the technical um, uh, implementations of, of the network will be. Um, and that fact is part of the fundamental strength of the Internet, part of what made it scale so fast, part of what's made it so powerful, part of what's made it facilitate so much speech and expression in so many surprising ways in every culture around the world. One thing that I, I, you know, I, I, I just want to stress is that from the administration's perspective, the goal of an open Internet, the goal of an Internet that supports freedom of expression, that supports the kind of um, staggeringly awesome uh, 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 array, a uh, vast uh, sort of um, wave of human creativity and expression that we see um, coursing over the, 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 the nerves and veins of the Internet every day. Uh, maintaining that, accelerating that, enabling that is fundamentally important. Lee, you know, mentioned uh, remix culture. I mean, this is one of the great, I mean, if you're like a pop culture geek like I am, like this is one of the great, you know, sort of like pleasures of the Internet is to see this kind of like transformation using the power of fair use that our IP laws have, you know, recognized and made available to recapture bits of culture, to create parodies, criticisms, to do politics in a, in a way which is vastly less tedious and, uh, uh, and controlled than it's been done for, you know, uh, since, you know, maybe the, uh, the, the more vigorous campaigns of the, of the 19th century. Um, before the days of the, the sort of infantilizing uh, uh, mass media that, uh, that, uh, 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 that I think lie in our past. Um, so anyway, uh, the, these open government principles are just of fundamental importance and will guide the administration's um, efforts to try to, you know, uh, make progress on these problems. I presented a paper to NSF and OECD several years ago saying that the future of the Internet is not the Internet, and I still believe that today. So what I mean is that when uh, we're talking about the future or clean slate internet, we're sort of missing the point to a certain extent. We're focusing on this sort of network infrastructure level, which is absolutely central and critical, but where people live is in a world of devices, of uh, machine, digital machines around them, of content and resources and all kinds of areas that are on and off the internet, on mobile devices, on TVs and computers, on printers, everywhere around you. So that Internet of Things, or the things, all those things, and the Internet are sort of merging somehow through mobile and wireless connectivity. Of course, I'm very glad that, that Lee used the, uh, the P word, uh, which is not in fact privacy. Uh, it is paradox, because increasingly as we look at issues related to Internet policy, we see a lot of paradox. Uh, people say to me, you know, you know, what's up? I mean, kids nowadays, they don't care about uh, privacy. I mean, that's kind of a 20th century thing. First answer, by the way, is, you know, try to friend your kids on Facebook, and you'll get, like, <laughs> an instant lesson in the ongoing value of privacy. No doubt about that one. 
Um, but the second point is, even though people put out all this personal information, they still feel that they want to exercise some control over it. They don't have a view that says, oh, gee, I'm a data exhibitionist. You know, everyone come and take a look. The review's much more like, here's a photo of my friend from the party last week. You four guys got to check this out. And it's this desire to want to exercise some control over digital identity that is actually framing many of the big debates that are happening today in the online world. Do you know that there were over 100,000 Facebook users who joined a group called Facebook Users Against the New Terms of Service. I mean, I was amazed that people could actually spell terms of service, <laughs> right? <coughs> what they were objecting to were changes in the Facebook policy that appeared to give the company greater control over the user-generated content that people were posting and less control over their ability to delete their digital identities and start over if they chose to do so. To me, that was entirely a debate about privacy. It was a debate about the control of identity in this digital world. Now, I don't mean to go all Habermas on you, but this desire to negotiate you know, public and private spaces is an essential part of the human condition. And we've been doing it, you know, forever, from the village, you know, to the city, uh, to new communication networks, to online communities. And I don't think anything there has actually changed. I just think you're seeing it presented in a new way.